My name is Aaron Grunfeld. I'm co-chairman of the Speakers Program. It is a distinct honor for the Associated Speakers Program to have as our guest today Dr. Max Rafferty. Dr. Rafferty is State Superintendent of Public Instruction and a Regent of the University of California. He has written two bestsellers, Suffer Little Children and What Are They Doing to Your Children? He has a nationally syndicated column in over 50 newspapers across the country. Following Dr. Rafferty's presentation, there will be an informal discussion and coffee hour in 2408. You're all invited. At those time, at that time, any of you who have comments or questions to raise uh, can feel free to do so. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Max Rafferty, who will speak on the education and the individual. Dr. Rafferty. It's nice to get back to my old campus. And incidentally, there are uh, those, uh, I'm sure, uh, joking hisses that I heard are reminiscent of the old days. You know, Disraeli once got <laughs> hissed in public. I think it was old Dizzy. And... Uh, he had the comeback uh, complete. He said there are, well, it couldn't have been Disraeli. I think it was, it was one of our modern statesmen. But anyway, he said there are only three things in this world that hiss, a snake, a goose, and a flat tire. Well, these folks stand up and identify themselves. The, uh, I'm sure that many of you are here today in response to that glowing editorial in the Daily Bruin. I, uh, I like that one. I was telling the gang in here in the antechamber where we met to huddle before the meeting that when I left this campus uh, and graduated in 1938, the Daily Bruin back in those days was writing editorials about me then, and after a lapse of almost 30 years, it's refreshing to see that, as the French say, the more things change, the more they remain the same. And it's nice to note an aura of stability in an otherwise transient and uh, ephemeral world. It's like old times, as a matter of fact. Actually, you have no conception down here in Southern California about uh, how really tough newspapers can get. Down here, although you may not realize it, and I didn't realize it because I've been a Los Angeles, Southern Californian all my life until they sent me up to Sacramento a few years back, but actually you can't have any conception uh, how gentle and polite and even benevolent Southern California newspapers are until you go up north and associate with some of those northern California newspapers. There is quite a difference, believe me. And for a schoolman who usually spends most of his time in a sort of an ivory towerish situation, this, uh, this can be pretty traumatic. Uh, for example, the first exposure, the baptism of fire I got to a Bay Area newspaper was shortly after I arrived up north in 1963, and I had been rather critical of some of the textbooks used down in the lower grades of the schools, and I had referred to them in the phrase Jenkins Lloyd Jones coined back East sawdust sandwiches, which some of them are, and I'd been pretty beastly to some of the books. And the, uh, this particular San Francisco newspaper ra ran the story under the headline, Rafferty admits being textual deviant. Now, this can be sort of a shock to a schoolman. If you read it fast, you're in trouble. But uh, speaking of newspapers, uh, everything else really pales into insignificance alongside my new hometown newspaper, the Sacramento Bee. Now the Bee, I regret to tell you on this beautiful March morning in Westwood, is not one of my greatest and most universal admirers. In fact, it ranks me somewhere in between Adolf Hitler and Attila the Hun. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the Bee has a magnificent headline writer one which the Daily Bruin should really take some lessons from because he can really manage to capsulize things. And when the word got out not too long ago that I had accepted an invitation from the Massachusetts State Teachers Association to fly east on TWA on October 31st and address their uh, institute in a northern city of that great sister metropolis, of Mass uh, that great sister commonwealth of Massachusetts, the bee ran the story under a classic headline, which I am currently preserving under glass for the edification of my grandchildren. And it read simply, Rafferty to fly over Salem on Halloween. I thought that was wonderful. 
I'd like to thank the ASUCLA for inviting me here today and to thank them as a group, but quite frankly, I'm not here to address you as a group. I really, despite the practice I've had, I still don't know how to talk to associations or cliques or herds of humanity. And in fact, if I must level with you, I don't much like groups, any groups. I guess I would be a washout as a political boss or a backstage manipulator of masses of human beings. But I am, as an individual, and I hope as an educator, incorrigibly fond of John and Mary and Joe and Jane, and I'll talk to them by the hour, although I promise I won't do that to you today. The most fun I get in life is meeting persons, not people. There is a difference. Talking with them, listening to them, getting to know them. I am an educator, and old Socrates, the original organizer of my union, found out a long time ago that the best way both to teach and to learn was to get into a conversation with persons. So if you don't mind, this is not going to be either a speech or a lecture today, just a dialogue between individuals, you and me. And if you can't engage in your part of the dialogue due to the acoustic and logistic problem here, we're going to make it just as informal as we can. The topic, with your permission, will be what's going to happen to us individuals. And I'd like to have you think on this for a few minutes today. First of all, as background material, let's take a brief look at what happened to some other residents of this planet who decided quite some time ago that individualism might be okay for the birds, but is certainly not for the bees. A beehive, you know, is a comfortable place. It's warm, safe, stocked with delicious food. Its inhabitants are disciplined, cooperative, seemingly happy. They labor unceasingly in highly specialized but relatively pleasant jobs for the greater good of the hive. In return, they're cared for by the insect equivalent of the welfare state or the great society, from the cradle to the grave, or maybe it would be more accurate under the circumstances to say from egg to bird's craw, which is where most of them end up. They're perfectly adjusted to their environment, are the bees. They're born, they eat, they reproduce, they die. And it's pretty hard for the casual observer to find any difference at all in the way most bees look and act. Such is the life of the social insect, in fact, and such it has been unchanged and unchanging for about 50 million years, give or take a few million. Now there's just one slight disadvantage connected with this seemingly foolproof system, the disappearance of the individual. Any baby bee which, touched perhaps by some random cosmic ray, showed the slightest sign of becoming an insect Moses, Newton, or Leonardo da Vinci, would ring alarm bells or their equivalent all over the hive and alert the guardians of the elaborate structure to perform the insect equivalent of mercy killing euthanasia upon the unfortunate mutation. In justice to our ancient friends, the bees, it should be pointed out, too, that they would take equally drastic preventive action against any larval Hitler, Stalin, or Genghis Khan. They have thus achieved the delicate balance sought for by all advanced cultures. It's an efficient, highly developed society, operating for the good of all. It's completely materialistic, absolutely egalitarian, and 100% deadly to the individual who happens to be even slightly different. It has found apparently that the individual is just more trouble than he's worth, especially when vast population masses have to be provided for. Now I submit that the bees who are our seniors on this planet by a good many millions of years have arrived at this evidently final stage of their development through the pressure of strong evolutionary forces acting upon billions upon billions of individuals. And it's my further contention that similar forces acting upon the rapidly multiplying hordes of our own species, and they are rapidly multiplying these days, will tend to produce similar results. For good measure, and for what it may be worth, I'll throw in my own personal theory that too many of us educators are currently helping these evolutionary forces along to the very best of our ability, unfortunately. The individual should be, and until just a few years ago, historically speaking, always had been the be-all and the end-all of my profession. This country was founded by individualists, some of them pretty rugged. 
The school stressed the virtues of individualism, and the churches uh, concerned themselves with the saving of individual souls. Not anymore. This new philosophy of education, which came in about 30 years ago, called life adjustment education, or many other names, has helped change this whole pattern of American life. The great dogma of group adaptation forms the cornerstone of 20th century educational theory. As laid down by the disciples, the spreaders of the gospel according to St. John Dewey, a man who paradoxically enough professed to abhor all change, the only eternal verity is that of constant change and flux. All values are relative, all truths are mutable, all standards are variable, What's good today may be evil tomorrow and vice versa. So the only thing worth teaching to anybody is the ability to adjust to his environment, to be easily, happily, comfortably accepted by his peer group. This is what the life adjusted boys really believe, as I've worked with them, lived with them, fought with them for 26 years across the country. This is what they teach children, and this is precisely one of the things that's wrong. Now let's just see a couple of for instances how the steady increase in the millions of our population, and we're currently pushing 200 million. In another few years, we're going to have the equivalent of the present population of India. Did you know that? Let's just see how this steady increase, combined with life adjustment education's glorification of the group at the expense of the individual, have affected two important segments of the American people. And with malice of forethought, let's bring up the first segment for obvious reasons. Let's take a look at our college students. You're all familiar, I know, with the recent unpleasantnesses up north. The unrest is still there. Causes have not been removed, to my knowledge. As one member of 24 of the university's Board of Regents, it's been one of my jobs the past year or so to try to help bring order out of chaos in that complicated and extremely thankless situation up there. Things now, I suppose, are at least temporarily cooled off. At least we don't hear about anybody gnawing the legs of policemen there these days. But in working with young people, I found out a long time ago it's not enough merely to uphold authority and to put down threats to law and order. Necessary, though this is, if you're going to get any kind of arena for logical arguments to be paraded into. There's something more on that Berkeley campus than just the antics of the few exhibitionists and the cynical opportunism of the few that President Kerr termed hardcore activists who sparked the illegal activities there and took advantage of them in the first place. But there is an addition to this, which shows up on the television and in the newspapers, a very real, if somewhat incoherent and ill-expressed grievance on the part of a great number of sincere and sober students who make up the vast, overwhelming majority of the pupil population there. And I think with which all of us as citizens of this state should concern ourselves, and particularly you, because you're going to inherit this mess. This grievance is loss of identity, erosion of self-respect, increasing inability to identify as an individual with an institution numbering more than 27,000 souls. I assume that this problem is not unique on the Berkeley campus. I saw some of the incipient phases of it when I was an undergraduate here. And I assume that it is, while not endemic, certainly a constant problem. This student feeling, as I see it today, may be described haltingly as a kind of creeping facelessness. A loss of both individuality and individualism in a vast multiversity which of necessity concerns itself more and more with great esoteric problems vital to the national interest top secret research, that sort of thing. Whereas once, not too long ago, the university was engaged, almost exclusively, not quite, in instructing young people and in providing them with the intellectual tools which over the centuries have proved indispensable in the pursuit of truth. And this, up until our own time, has always been not only the main purpose, but the sole purpose of any institution of higher learning. 
One college undergraduate up there at Berkeley wrote me a few months ago, as far as a sophomore girl, as a matter of fact. She wrote me this, quote, I am photographed, inoculated, taped, carded, and filed. I have a parking pass and a library pass and a laboratory pass and several others. I sit in a lecture class with 700 others and I'm number 327. The professor's lecture is piped in electronically. I never get to see him. The multiple choice tests I take are collected automatically, corrected automatically, graded automatically, and handed back automatically. I engage in group activities, group health services, group recreation, and I presume before long in logical sequence group therapy. But I came to college to find myself, to learn how to become a person. Instead, I have become a number, unquote. Now, I can tell by some of your faces that this is not an unfamiliar problem to you and that it troubles you, and well, it ought. I tell this story to hundreds of audiences composed of your elders and in some cases your parents throughout the state. And whenever I get to this point, I always pause and I look, and there is a, a sort of a Pavlovian reflex going on. And they go that way. They're looking over the show. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for George. They're looking for the George who is responsible, somebody to blame it on. And right there we go to the canvas because there isn't anybody to blame it on except the person you see in the mirror as far as they are concerned. The somebody is they, if I may be grammatical. Why should they be surprised at such a letter as this? I wonder what else they expected. Didn't they permit and even condone over the years an educational way of thinking in our public schools, which many of you, probably most of you, have been through yourselves, which downgraded competition, which upgraded togetherness, which stressed the supremacy of the group over the individual, which generally preached the overriding importance of life adjustment as compared to individual mastery of essential fundamentals? No wonder so many of our colleges are turning into huge factories. I spoke at Ohio State the other day. They had the same beef. When people are conditioned from early childhood to believe that adjustment to one's environment is the supreme goal of life, when they're taught day after day that acceptance by the group is more important than the development of the individual's own potential and ability, on their group by social age, down in the grades, and pass through school with their peers, regardless of whether or not many of them are able to meet any reasonable standards of performance. When all these things have been going on in this state and in many others for 25 years or more, with the active or passive consent of the general public which supports and populates the schools, how else can they expect our colleges and universities to deal with the products of such a system of education? I guess I talk to more young people of your age than any other man in the state, perhaps more than any other man in the country. With many classic exceptions, they have been conditioned to the very best of this system's ability to conform. They've been trained to cooperate, they've been educated to adjust, and in just about one more generation, two at the most, they should be about ready for the hive. And they will be, too unless we change our ways and unless you can find some way in the years immediately ahead to break through this sterile revolving door pattern of conformity. Young people feel this unconsciously. If I were to point to one thing that spurred those demonstrations at Berkeley, it would be this. It's time we all realized it consciously. I don't want adjustment to our environment. I don't want anybody to adjust to his environment. Adjustment to the 20th century is to come to terms with madness. What we have to do is change things, not to conform to them and accept them. Had the men and women who came across the thousand leagues of stormy sea to found this country so long ago practiced this kind of philosophy of adjustment to environment being the supreme goal of life, and had they taught it to their children, we, their descendants, would still be living today in log cabins along a narrow strip of the Atlantic seaboard and fighting off Indians. Well, this would have represented a perfect optimum adjustment to the environment which they found. Instead, they preferred to take that environment, to change it, to shape it, and to mold it a little closer to their heart's desire, or rather what they wanted in the future for their children. I'm not at all surprised that a lot of people are protesting. A lot of students at Berkeley are protesting. It's the last gasp. It's that last instinctive quiver of the wounded animal before he sinks back into quiescence. 
It's a fact. Now, the sad thing about it isn't the fact of the protest. The fact that it was taken over there, as it often is, and exploited by certain cold-eyed outfits interested in nothing much about the university except the opportunity to stir up trouble and cause chaos there. But these are very few. The vast majority of those people there are not in this category at all. Well, anyway, here's the way the trend toward the hive is affecting currently just one element of the population, but it's an element much in the headlines, namely you. Now let's turn to another element. Also, even more in the headlines, are racial minorities. Now here you're going to have to bear with me a minute because I'm going to claim the immemorial privilege of the visiting speaker, the visiting fireman who comes in by request and takes five minutes to talk about himself, and I'm going to do it. Since you're a captive audience, you think you have to listen or get out. I just happen to be a member of one of the most discriminated against groups ever to emigrate to this continent, believe it or not. For centuries, my people, the Irish, had been dispossessed and jailed and starved and slaughtered in their own land by an alien usurper. A hundred years ago, after a frightful famine had killed off a large percentage of the total population of their little island, the survivors disembarked upon these shores, hungry, illiterate, ragged, unclean, and highly unwelcome. One of them was my great-grandfather. They sought bare survival here, and for about two generations, that was all they found. Almost immediately throughout the East, the signs went up everywhere, no Irish allowed, no Irish need apply. We do not rent to Irish. Change one word in that, it sounds familiar today, doesn't it? Business careers were closed to them. The learned professions were barred to them. Their accent was mocked publicly. Their customs were burlesqued in cartoons and on the stage. The men were called micks and paddies, insultingly. They were allowed only to lay bricks and carry hods, or a little later to leave their bones under almost every cross tie of the Great Union Pacific Railroad as it fought its long way westward across the continent. Their women were derisively nicknamed biddies and were grudgingly permitted to serve as laundresses, cooks, and housemaids in the homes of the rich. No band of immigrants ever had it any tougher, believe me. Yet within just about five decades, the Irish had broken out of the ghettos and had merged with the general American landscape. Irish names appeared on the roster of every profession and calling. Some of them became wealthy, more of them stayed poor. But in neither case was it the result of their Irishness. Within another 50 years, one of them had become president. How was it done? Not by any special talent or intelligence which the Irish happened to possess, not at all. It was just that they managed finally to get America to treat them as individuals instead of members as a group, which is the way they were treated universally when they first got here. And this is the whole trick. They persuaded their own children to think of themselves, and eventually their fellow Americans to think of them too as men and women. Tall, short, fat, thin, homely, handsome, stupid, smart, just like the rest of us. Now mark this, and mark it well. Had the Irish been conditioned as children to think of themselves primarily as members of a national or religious group, which they certainly were, or even as members of a broader, planned, blander peer group, to use our modern terminology, they would have stayed in that group indefinitely. Had they been sold a bill of goods about adjusting to their environment as the supreme goal of existence, they would have adjusted to those dirty, cheerless jobs, backbreaking, menial life in the ghettos. They would still be working at them today. Had they been told over the years that mastery of subject matter was far less important than things like democratic sharing and peer group socializing, they would never have learned enough to convince their fellow Americans of their ability to get things done. And this is the one common denominator that all Americans share. We may differ and fight like Kilkenny cats over everything else, but this is one common denominator. America always respects people who can get things done. It's as old as the Jamestown colony, which almost foundered because they couldn't get things done. Had the Irish been taught that competition was evil in itself, they would have stayed as low man on the national totem pole, kept there by those who could compete better than they could. 
What I'm trying to say is that during the historical period when the Irish were breaking out of the permanent minority group category, our school system then, and this is something I do know about, because it's my bailiwick, was stressing basic education, the dignity of the individual, and the overriding importance of organized discipline and systematic mastery of subject matter by each pupil as the open sesame to the future. During this same period of time, the Negro American and the Mexican American, presently our greatest ethnic minorities, were in most states and in most cases not getting any education at all, period. In more recent years, and under universal compulsory education, they began for the first time to be enrolled in schools in large numbers. But it was during these same recent years that the life adjustment cult took over those same schools, lock, stock, and barrel, and started preaching the gospel of groupism at any cost. Groupism is not what our racial minorities need. They've had too much of it already. When you react to stimuli only as a member of a group, when you find your self-respect and self-fulfillment only as a member of a group, when you vote only as a member of a group, then you're just asking to be treated according to that lowest common denominator of that same group, whatever it may be. You abdicate your right to be treated as an individual in favor of the right to be treated as just one more cog in the machine, one more faceless figure in the crowd, one more bee in the hive. But you're not a bee. Nobody has the right to regard you or any other American as simply one more member of a certain swarm. A century ago, my people all had the same accent and wore the same costume and had the same religion, every one of them. There was a great temptation as a result of this for other Americans to regard them as all alike, that fatal oversimplification, and to label them accordingly, all alike, and to deal with them in the mass instead of as separate, living, breathing human beings, each with a different personality and a different immortal soul. It's greatly to the credit of our country that we have successfully overcome in the past the temptation to fragment our country into Irish Americans or German Americans or any other kind of special Americans. Such terminology did exist for a time, true. But happily, the climate, the tradition, the genius of our people has been uncongenial in the long run to most attempts to lure us onto the fatal path of hyphenated Americanism. The last two relics of this ancient era, the terms Negro American and Mexican American, must now be subjected to the same influences which wiped out the terms Irish American and German American. Now, if I were a member of a current minority group in this year, 1966, as my great-grandfather was in the year 1866, I would do these things, I think. Number one, as a parent, I would insist upon an educational philosophy in my local schools which emphasize the importance of the individual rather than the desirability of in-groupness. A philosophy of education which taught every child to use the wonderful, glittering, sharp-edged sort of subject matter to gain success for himself. A philosophy of education which took my youngster where it found him, wherever that was, and taught him to read so well and to spell so well and to speak and write English and other things so well that he would be superior to the graduates of other schools and other states as an individual, not as a member of any group. Secondly, as a breadwinner, I would continually upgrade my own capabilities and potentialities in the occupation of my choice by taking advantage of adult education, night school classes, college extension courses, wherever and whenever I could find them. If I couldn't read very well, I'd take remedial reading. If I spoke bad English, by golly, I'd study good English like mad. If I needed some special skill to enable me to get a better job and to earn more money, you can bet I'd find a school that offered it and I'd sign up for it and I'd take it. And those schools are everywhere in this state. Thirdly, as a voter, I would join a political party which treated me as an individual, not as a member of a voting bloc. I would support better laws for everybody. 
knowing that everybody includes me. And I would resent any efforts to use me as a minority member in order to perpetuate any person or any party in power. I would resist with my ballot any attempt to discriminate against me because of my race, whether by the government, by industry, or by organized labor. Now, if I may wax personal again for another minute, as your state superintendent of public instruction, I have tried hard, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully, to practice what I preach. This is the hardest thing in the world to do. Talk is very, very cheap. When I appointed two distinguished Negro educators to the highest posts ever held in California by members of that race, it was because they were the best men for the job and proved it, not because they were simply members of a group. Their race didn't help them a bit, but it didn't hurt them a bit either. When I appointed an educator of Mexican ancestry to be my assistant superintendent in charge of all Southern California, to occupy the state superintendent's office in the great state building here in Los Angeles, the same identical thing was true. He was the best man for the job and still is. Here then is a formula for the future, for what it's worth. Press for recognition as a person and qualify yourself to be worthy of that recognition. Get out from under the dead hand of uniformity wherever it tries to lower itself on you. Fight against statism, groupism. Work to build a land in which the opportunity of each individual will be limited only by the measure of the man and by the luck of the draw. This while way lies equality for all and special favoritism for none and no American can ask for more than this. Nothing more is really necessary, but nothing less, not one jot or tittle less will do. And above all, just to you now, for heaven's sake, resolve together never to surrender in the years that lie ahead to the sheer numbing weight of numbers. Just because mankind is breeding in a terrifying explosion of population around the world, don't sit back in our several groups and wait numbly and apathetically for inevitable tragedy. It may well be, you know, it may very well be that the great contribution which America has yet to make in its cycle of universal history is the solution to this one crucial overriding problem, the survival of the individual, precious and unique in a world of constantly multiplying billions. Surely, surely in the hammering out of a mighty issue such as this one, there's a vital role for every American to play, whether college student, racial minority, member educator, non-educator, businessman, trade unionist. A role which each of us is going to have to act out and hopefully add to until the time comes for us to leave the stage to those who will come after us. For tomorrow will come, it always does, one way or another. But make no mistake, it's up to us as individual citizens and to you in particular as the future citizenry of the country, which is at once the hope of the envy of the human race, to determine whether in the on-surging and billowing wave of the future Mankind is going to hear the laughter and the shouting of free men or the murmuring of innumerable bees.